Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, as your first speaker up for the day, um, I really weighed what I was supposed to be doing besides kind of setting a tone here. And I realized the best I could do is just speak for myself. Um, this area of study, to be dispassionate, this profoundly personal life-changing experience, to be very specific, is so misunderstood and been so uh, distorted in the media, it's been mystified, it's been mechanized in terms of the way people think about it. It's been communicated with great love and great fear. And I want to start off the day by trying to sort some of this out, but I have to tell you beforehand that the views, the thoughts, the beliefs that I express are purely my own and may or may not be reflective of the sponsoring organization or any of my colleagues. And please make no mistake about that. I don't want anybody to be tarred with a brush that I have wielded if you disagree with me. A boy and his parents are traveling along an interstate highway in Pennsylvania. The time is approximately 11.30 p.m. Nothing untoward has marked the drive when he suddenly feels shocked into consciousness and hears his mother say, where the hell are we? They are no longer on the interstate but on a secondary road in a heavily wooded area. They drive until they see a sign and check a map. They are more than 50 miles from the highway and it is now 3.30 a.m. They then make their way to their destination without stopping and without a word of discussion of what has transpired. A young woman grows up just outside of a large industrial city with many memories of other intelligences taking and interacting, talking and interacting with her before she is returned to her home surroundings. It was during one of these experiences that she recalled something looking at her from her bedroom door, a presence that was confirmed with the man she had been seeing at the time. All I can describe is an outline. It was skinny. It was skinny. That's all I can remember. During a separate incident, she experienced something in her bedroom, near her bed. This also being confirmed by the same man. Although it was emotionally difficult to do so, she sat up and tried to reach out to the entity with love and compassion. After that, the presence seemed to dissipate. A 34-year-old building contractor in California goes to sleep in his bedroom following a full day's work. He awakens during the night to notice a fluorescent blue-green light coming from under his bedroom door. The next thing he remembers is that four or five little beings are clustered around the bed. One of them produces a, quote, weird-looking instrument, and as he goes to sit up, another of the beings places its hand on his forehead. The man lays back down, unable to move. The bed covers then pull back, and the instrument is moved toward his crotch. The man clearly remembers saying or thinking loudly to the beings, you're not doctors, you can't do this. He then goes unconscious. Another man, growing up in Massachusetts, and a friend of mine, recalls the first abduction at the age of three. He recalled playing outside near his house when all of a sudden, boom, I turned around, I was playing with my trucks, and there they were. Out of the corner of his eye, he sees two beings appearing from nowhere, and then some sort of rod was used to put him under. He remembered running to his mother after he was returned, and how frustrated he became when he was unable to remember what had happened. I saw big ants out there, he said. This episode was one he explored through regressive hypnosis with his then therapist, and then in 1991 with Dr. John Mack. A woman in the Midwest reports variations of a similar reoccurring dream. In it, she finds herself in a well-lit space along with one or more non-human beings holding what is commonly referred to, uh, what are commonly referred to in the literature as grays. One of the beings is holding an infant. 
The baby is human-like in appearance, but not quite human. It seems to possess features shared with both her and them. She is told that the baby is hers and is then asked, always telepathically, to hold it and by implication or direction to bond with it. Please understand that for every one of these type of more or less unnerving, incredibly anxiety provoking for many people accounts, there is another one that is positive, transcendent, and in many cases inspiring, at least to the individual that has happened to it. But how is it that so many people from so many places and so many backgrounds continue to come forward and never without the risk of ridicule or unwanted attention to insist that such things have happened to them? Is it a manifestation of some yet undiagnosed mental condition or a confluence of psychological abnormalities that somehow conspired to convince them of such things? Was it the result of an uncontrollable desire to feel special, one of my personal favorites, or perpetrate a hoax? Are these alleged abductees and experiences under the controlling influences, as suggested by some, of nefarious, obviously mentally ill individuals whose twisted intention is to make them believe such obviously impossible memories are authentic and do so when these people are under hypnosis with them. Could it possibly be somehow imprinted on the brain itself, on our unconsciousness, from some particularly uh, effective science fiction book or movie? Or are these people just plain liars intent on making people like me and my colleagues appear foolish in public? Something I can do perfectly well on my own, I might add. Are they acting on some deeply driven desire to achieve fame? Because it's sure not money. By associating themselves with just about the most controversial subject imaginable in the history of the human race. My experience is that outright fabrications are exceedingly rare in this field. I think I've encountered certainly less than five in more than 35 years. No, like it or not, in the overwhelming number of instances, these people are relating their memories of events that actually happened. And they are as real to them as this moment is to us. The very idea that such things happen makes most people's minds real, and for a very long list of easy to grasp reasons. Is there any wonder that society's take on the subject is riddled with fear, misunderstanding, and an almost universal unwillingness to face the facts squarely? No. Much easier to dismiss a thought as someone else's fantasy based on this simple equation. It can't be, therefore it isn't, therefore it must be something else. Likely, I'd be among the non-abductee experiencers to feel this way if it weren't for several important factors in my life. Throughout most of the 1980s and 90s, I had the privilege of working as assistant to a man named Bud Hopkins, arguably the person who pioneered the whole field of serious scientific investigation of the abduction phenomena. I've also been privileged to have as a friend and colleague, Dr. John Mack, as well as David Jacobs, Kathleen Martin, Stanton Friedman, Denise Stoner, and other abduction and experiencer-focused investigators, who are some of the finest and most dedicated professionals I've ever known. My responsibilities with Bud became very wide-ranging over the years, but they included evaluating and responding to hundreds, if not thousands, of letters and phone calls from people all over the country and to a degree all over the world who were concerned or convinced 
that they have had these types of experiences. And such letters and calls were hardly unique to Bud. Investigators here and abroad have collected many similar thousands of accounts. I think Whitley Strieber and Ann Strieber collected, I don't know, tens and tens of thousands of such accounts over the years since Communion came out in 1987, a very short time before Bud Hopkins' best-selling book, Intruders. Up until the 1970s, abduction reports were exceedingly rare, the best known by far being Betty and Barney Hill's 1961 New Hampshire abduction. Extensive news coverage several years after the fact caused this event to become extremely well known, as did the release of the very powerful 1975 made-for-television movie, The UFO Incident, based on John Fuller's outstanding account of that uh, uh, incident in his book, The Interrupted Journey. Initially, the UFO research community approached the subject with understandable skepticism. And I actually remember this period of time because it's when I really first became involved. The way that most of us, and most of the senior players saw it, here are a bunch of adults struggling to be taken seriously in what we'll laughingly call the normal world on the UFO phenomena itself. Dave Jacobs, whose work has very disturbing conclusions relative to the UFO phenomena, and who is the very first person to say literally, somebody prove I'm wrong. These are the conclusions that I'm getting. Uh, David has one of the driest senses of humor in the world, and when you deal with very disturbing material, sometimes a little bit of humor at the right moment is an extremely effective tool in making your message clear. It literally uh, lets your audience take a breath and get back to the business of being in contact with your presenter. Dave described it as the UFO research community was busy getting the numbers on the license plates and completely neglecting the fact that there were drivers in these vehicles. Also at the time, and understandably, it was thought, and I think common sense would dictate, that if you had had an abduction experience, a genuine, anomalous, true, real abduction or contact experience, it was probably the same ratio of rarity as being hit by lightning or winning a major lottery. We now know it's just the opposite. And that there is no question that it seems to follow familial bloodlines. If it happened to you, it happened to one of your parents. It may have happened to one of your siblings, and your children or one of your kids may be involved. It is the way it is. And again, the opposite attitude at the time in the late 70s, as Dave wonderfully put it, was um, visualize two Martians in a flying saucer going over Nebraska, and they spot a farmer, and one Martian says to the other one, there's one, let's get him. Not the way it really is. Nonetheless, a small handful of investigators began to study the claims of the hills with a handful of others that had come forward. If such claims proved to be legitimate, they postulated, surely they'd be random, much like lightning striking, etc. Among abduction researchers, there are significantly divergent theories as to why the things that are happening are happening. And who is responsible for it? Speaking broadly, these views break down accordingly. The abductors are from somewhere out there and are involved in a program to breed hybrid beings who are part us and part them for reasons we can only ponder, and that their program for a program is just what it is. The euphemism experimenting or testing often comes up, but the evidence is too overwhelming that this is some sort of program and one possibly coming into its next phase, whatever that may be, is far more likely to their benefit than ours. Others maintain that the intelligences involved are following this line of behavior, but overall, 
that their interests are toward humanity and our betterment or uh, assistance to our home planet. Then there are those who maintain that while some abductions are being conducted by aliens, others are being uh, the result of a highly classified military program whose nefarious purpose is to credit, discredit, I'm sorry, these other intelligences and create fear when we should really be welcoming their assistance. Finally, there is that group which maintains that the intelligences are categorically good and that literally all abductions reported are the product of highly classified military black op or MILABs as they're called. Um, and again, that their intent is to discredit the aliens who are all good. How common are UFO-related abductions and visitations? Of course, no one knows for sure. There are bodies of statistics that give us an indication. But for those people who have sought me out over time at conferences and the like and shared their accounts with me and the amount of individuals I was exposed to and working with Bud and people in my own life the odd friend or family member or business associate who, knowing what I do and that I'm good at keeping confidences, has shared with me an event in their life, I can't tell you what the ratio is, but I think I can say without hesitation that every one in this room, whether you have a circle of friends, acquaintances, neighbors, and you know, past business associates, that is 30 people or 300 people. Everybody knows at least one person that this has happened to. And that number is shatteringly high. It's millions of people in this country. And God only knows how many millions of people around the world. It is certainly the greatest secret that lies just below the surface of official reality our day-to-day -day lives, the history that people are living with their families, and there is no question in my mind about that. Okay. Like some experiencers and abductees, some of my colleagues are convinced that they know and understand what the true nature of the abduction phenomena is. I'm reminded of the definition ascribed to a Zen beginner, which is knowing that you know nothing and having it be all right. Now, I know more than nothing about this subject, but I am very good, especially in radio interviews, and chatting with people, to answer many questions by saying, I don't know. Now, I know people in the work that if you ask them what's going on, they will give you a response, something to this effect. Well, the Alpha Centaurians have been coming here for 475,000 years in these types of ships. They wear these clothes, they eat mice, dust, and carpeting uh, fiber, and the reason that they're here is this. The Pleiadians, on the other hand, have been coming here for, you know, 487,000 years and three weeks. Uh, they dress like this, their intentions for humanity are this, they do this. Then there are the Nordics, then there are reptilians, then there are blah, 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 blah. For me, I don't shut down when I hear such responses, but I do take exception, and very strong exception. A very well-known colleague um, some time back uh, was quoted as saying, as I recall, there are 68 alien races visiting uh, the world. My first thought is, how dare you? You are stating something that is, by definition, unknowable. If you are one of the alien races, how can you be sure how many other of your competitors are coming and going? If you're the head of the NSA, or the President of the United States, or the head of MJ-12, I don't care. That is an inaccessible number. And it is emblematic of something that many people do relative to this overwhelmingly impossible to wrap our heads around subject. They tend to substitute 
in good faith, without malice, but completely substitute myth, allegation, legend, or hearsay for actual findings or any actual real proof or empirical fact. We are all entitled to our opinions here, but when you cross that line, language is very powerful, and you substitute a word like, um, the fact is that there are 68 races visiting this planet, as opposed to, it's my belief, or I feel, or I've come to conclude, or they told me, or I saw in a documentary, or it came to me in a dream. For me, that is not acceptable. And I oppose it in every area. Now, there are people who've had these experiences, who come away from some of these experiences with information that's been imparted to them. And you're gonna hear some of them this weekend from all points of view. And some of the information that's shared is traumatic. Some of it is inspiring. Some of it is in the form of a warning. Some of it is in the form of wholesale information. And sometimes it has to do with a number. Now, if this has happened to you, and you have heard that voice in your head, who am I to question that? In fact, I know that it may be something that is beyond me, or totally fantastic. And that even in 35 plus years, I'm just not getting it. I have not had these experiences, but it is personal for me. It now involves many, many people who I've grown to care for very much in my life, a good number of them who I love as friends, uh, my late sister Helen, and at the same time, no matter how I've got, how close I get to the data, or to the individuals, or to the accounts, or physical evidences, I'm still an outsider. And in that same spirit, two of my fellow speakers um, were professionals in this field, uh, and that's Stan T. Friedman and Kathleen Martin, who you'll be hearing. I love the fact that this <clears throat> extraordinary event focuses on all of you who have had these experiences and not those of us that interpret them, study them, write about them, explain them to the world. Some people say that the reason for these extremely different experiences people are having has to do with the individual. And that if you come from love and an openness in your heart, that you will have a positive experience. Well, I think some people that have had negative experiences would disagree with you. Or by the same token, if you come from fear and uh, a resistance to new ideas or to the unknown, it's going to be traumatic because you need an attitude adjustment. Now, I'm not saying that's not possible or that isn't part of the phenomena that's going on here. I've come to be convinced that we've got a lot of stuff going on here with quite a number of different other intelligences. I've never been very comfortable with the word alien, and nobody has ever invented a word for me that blanketly describes it. So, are these other intelligences from Alpha Centauri or the Dog Star or, you know, somewhere way out in the universe, another star system? Sure, why not? Are some of them more locally based? Perhaps historically over time migrated to the dark side of the moon or caverns inside our earth? Why not? Are some of them slipping in and out of another dimension? 
appearing in that manner and then slipping back. Certainly within the realm of possibility. I've come to respect what I don't understand, for starters, and go from there. Now, our emotions cover this, even if you are a person who is brought up in the most loving manner, in the most uh, intellectually generous family, with tremendous reinforcement, and um, if in a religion, one that is not forcing a certain amount of guilt or shame, but love and openness, it may still freak the hell out of you when you wake up and your bed is surrounded by little gray beings stalking inside your head who then float you through the wall, the ceiling, the plate glass window, and into their craft where you are examined. Another thing Dave Jacobs once said to me that I will never forget was imagine that somewhere out there, on some asteroid or planet, there is a factory. And there is a division in that factory that makes metal tables that are installed in their craft. When he said it like that, that really was pretty shattering, because that's exactly the fact. And literally all of the authentic reports of people who are on these tables. There are one or two things about these tables that is uniformly similar. They're punched out by the same machines. It was just one of those points. But Hopkins, who approached this as a pragmatist, a humanist, and somebody who was seeing it from a very Western point of view, by choice, felt, and I couldn't agree with him more, that in the most traumatizing cases, and in the most beneficent, positive instances that we had on record, there is always the thread of deception and manipulation that weaves its way through. Please keep that in mind. And manipulation is not a bad thing necessarily in the service of a good aim. But remember that any organization for lack of a more descriptive term, their first objective, their first stated objective, is always a white lie. Their first stated objective of the American Heart Association is to cure heart disease. The first stated objective of the uh, American Cancer Society is to cure cancer, etc., etc., etc. The first stated objective of, um, you know, uh, AT&T was to put people in touch with each other. No, those are always the second objectives. The first day objective is to stay alive and grow. And something is going on that is, well, I leave it to your good common sense to put the pieces together here. As far as transcendence goes, and I'm going to finish up in a moment here, we're going to take a brief break. I know that not only does having encounters like the ones you're going to hear about this weekend, positive and negative, for lack of a better term, change the individuals it happens to. It transforms their lives. And a few years ago, I started to think about, what has the impact of this been on me and my colleagues in our lives? And when I put my attention on it, I began to realize, good God, this has transformed me over the years as well. And in a number of ways that I would have never imagined, it's made me a lot more of a tolerant person, um, a lot more patient with people. When I encounter somebody whose attitude about this is informed by condescension, sarcasm, outright nastiness, um, I am always compelled to remember that behind that veneer of obnoxiousness is an individual who is scared shitless, or at least very anxious, or concerned that if this is true, then everything they may know be called to question. And that is not acceptable. By the same token, if you're a person of faith, and 
especially if you've grown up in more or less a fundamentalist tradition. And fundamentalism simply means that you have a fairly inflexible attitude. Your holy rules, laws, stories, guiding points are not open to interpretation. This is going to be a big honking problem for you too. I could go on, but I think you get the gist of this. Um, we are facing something that is truly unknown. For me, the greatest perk of this extraordinary journey that I've been on has been um, to live a life that other people dream of because of them and a decision that I made that fast in the 1970s when my sister Helen first told me about her abduction-related memories which now I would, I would classify as so rubber stamp routine that I've heard them hundreds of times, sometimes in the same words from people at the time, not only had I never heard them before, but it absolutely changed my life. I wanted to be a painter and a photographer, and that was all I ever wanted to be. But something more important and more compelling came along, and I followed that path and rarely looked back. We're going to take a 10 minute break and then come back for our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.